message from uh, my own family to start with the the um, for glimpse of God. Uh, we had Christmas at our house this year. We had our family Christmas, and that doesn't seem perhaps like much of a, of a troublesome thing to most of you, perhaps, but there's 30 to 40 of my immediate family living in town. We only do this at our house very infrequently for a number of reasons, not the least of which it's the house that all of us grew up in. My mother had this house in 64. My brothers and my sister grew up in this house. My sister bought the house. Her family and her four children grew up in this house. Someone bought the house between them and then we bought, or from them, and then we bought the house from that family in 1999. Linda and I did, and our two boys grew up there. In the last, since 1964, in those years to this date, only 10 years has this house not been in our possession. The neighbor, Dave, uh, Bill Davis from the Davis Fence Company, when we moved back in in 1999, he came out of his house. He looked at us and said, don't you McDermott's know this is a city here? There are all sorts of neighborhoods. <laughs> of course, he is now in the third generation of Davises living in his house next door to us. There's a bit of anxiety about having all the family over to your house, this fa- to, the, to their house. This, family is, this house is theirs, and, and you're the keeper of these memories and the keeper of these histories, and there's a little anxiety about that. What each, and the worst part of it is, is that as ministers on, on Christmas Eve, we're panicked, we're crazy that whole season up to Christmas. We barely have time to get the downstairs clean. Everything goes upstairs. I mean, the dogs, the books, the instruments, they just went random. Everything is upstairs. We have hardly any time. The downstairs is clean. I wake up on Christmas morning. Christmas night is when we'll have the party. Christmas morning, I wake up. I look at Linda say, oh, my God, my nieces are coming over. (laughs) Every time they've come over, before we can get to them, they run up to their bedroom. They want to remember And I'm thinking, how is that possible? There's no room for memories up there. I mean, we've just crammed it. And so we put a gate across the top of the stairs. On Christmas evening, by the time I've got things cleaned up in the kitchen and we're running back to the door, the nieces are already up the stairs. My my grandniece or or, or their daughters come down and they say, your dogs are really nice. And, and I'm thinking, what about the rest? And they said, you know, that hopefully they didn't see the rest of it. But my, my, my niece assures me, all I remember is just the memories. I didn't see anything else. But I know the worst is to come. And, and then I think about the others that will show up. And I worry about, uh, about my uncle. My uncle, one of my two uncles, uh, who some years ago moved to Israel. And all we heard of was a letter that came from him to the family on Christmas Day. It was read to the family years ago. And it said, I'm living in a cave in Amman, Jordan, waiting for the second coming. He discovered that he has Jewish roots. And he was allowed to buy up residence there because he had Jewish roots. My other uncle, his brother, said, we're not Jewish. My, under, my wife and I were sending him Hanukkah, Hanukkah cards for the next several years. But he didn't see the humor in it. But we worry now because he's been living back in the States. You never know what conversation will strike up when my uncle starts up into a conversation. All these anxieties. The second person to arrive after my nieces is my nephew, 35-year-old nephew of my older, my son, uh, the son of my older brother. And he's 6'3", he's 250 pounds. He has a deep, dark black beard, huge, long black hair. He's wearing camo jacket and a camo cap and jeans. He looks like one of the guys from Duck Dynasty. <laughs> I, and I think maybe he is somehow, and he's sitting there in the kitchen, and he's wondering if we had beer. And of course, we have some beer in the kitchen, the refrigerator. And I said, of course. And then I'm wondering, what are we going to talk about? And somehow, I just think about it, and I say, you know, we've had a squirrel problem in our house. His face lights up. <laughs> and for the next hour, we're talking about poisons and guns. My family has a whole mixture of individuals in it that just astonishes me sometimes in many more ways more than one way because, I mean, in my family, there are libertarians, there are diehard Democrats, there are dyed-in-the-wool Republicans, there are gays and straights, there are doctors and lawyers, there are self-employed laborer, or laborers, there are, are, are pharmaceutical representatives and lab directors who actually direct the research for the same pharmacies. It's such a diverse group. Uh, There are an atheist or two in my family, and then there are at least two Methodist ministers that I know of. (laughs) Some of them are wealthy, and some of them in my family have actually had hard time on the street. 
And when they're all gathered there, we somehow make it work. And we'll come to the living room, and there's the, there's the, there's the stockings over the fireplace. And my aunt, uh, my aunt Sally Ann, no longer with us, she made half of those stockings. And we look at them, and some of them look like they're 50 years old. And, and, and as we look at them, we remember Aunt Sally Ann. And, and, and she was one of these people that just, she was the perfect mixture of joy and misery, she had a laughter that could resurrect any pain or sadness, completely erase it. But she had an opinionated temper that was so stern and strict, she could level a city council. <laughs> she had literally brought one hospital wing to its knees during her last days. And I remember being in Michigan, and I told this to some of the folks gathered the other night. I said, I remember being in Michigan as a storyteller. I was telling a story up at a festival up there, and this was some years back. And this storyteller stepped up and said, oh, yeah, she was moving to Texas. And I said, really? She said, yeah, I, I just moved there. I've only been there for about a week. Came back up to do the festival because she was from Michigan. And she said, I moved to this little town. She mentioned the little town in the panhandle of Texas. I said, oh, my gosh, that's where my aunt lives. And, she, and I said... Well, well, you wouldn't know her. It's a pretty big town. And, and I said, and besides that, she doesn't cotton to people very well. And she's pretty well known. I mean, she's got a miserable temper. And she looked at me. She said, Sally Ann Davis? <laughs> we all laugh at our own family. We know we're a weird mixture. I read a story recently, a rabbinical tale. I'm going to just tell you the shortest version of it, but I think it illustrates somewhat this idea of glimpses of God and grace. And, and it's this fortune teller who traveled about at fair to, from fair to fair telling people's fortunes. And he was miserable. And he never seemed to bring anything out of people's fortunes but misery as well. He was bereft of any family, he just traveled alone. But at the same fair, there was always a peddler. And the peddler, he would look across the fairgrounds, and, the, and the, the teller would notice that this peddler always had a crowd gathered around him. Well, he, was, he had these beautiful, shiny stones. Naturally, people were curious about these beautiful stones. They're shiny rocks, blues, yellows, cat eyes, all sorts of different colors. And they seemed happy to have one. But the fortune teller himself never seemed to retain any of his customers. And it was probably because he said to himself, he was telling the truth. Misery. You're going to have pain in your future. There's going to be misery. It's not going to be good. And, of course, there was no repeat business. One of these fairs, he went over and he talked to the peddler, and he asked him, he said, you know, what is it that you do? And the peddler said, it's simple. I sell polished stones. And then he looked at the teller, and he said, if you'll tell my fortune, I'll give you one for free. Just tell my fortune. So the fortune teller did what he's always done, what he felt capable of doing. He looked into the peddler's eyes, and as he stared into the eyes, he said, all I can see are blues and slight browns, and then sort of like almost a galaxy of mystery back in the back of your eyes. I really don't see anything. And the, and the, and the peddler smiled, and he said, well, you've, you've told the truth. I don't know that I have much of a future. And he handed him a beautiful stone. They went their separate ways, but over time, these two kept running into each other at the fair. And over time, the peddler continued to give the fortune teller stones. Eventually, he asked the fortune teller to join in with him. And he was honest. He said, to be honest, friend, he says, you don't have much business and you're not keeping much business. Well, the fortune teller saw the truth in that future, and so he hung out with the peddler, and the two of them traveled from fair to fair. Every time they would stop, instead of telling others' fortunes, the peddler would simply say, look into my eyes and tell me my fortune. I'll give you another stone. But something began to happen as the peddler began to encourage the teller, the fortune teller, to tell his own story. You see, as they would travel from fair to fair, the fortune teller couldn't help but notice in the back of the cart was this loud rumbling sound. And all the peddler would say is, it's the woes of the world tumbling behind us. And that's all he would say. But as the fortune teller would ponder this, what that meant, he would then look over and he'd say, so tell me about your story. 
How did you get to be a fortune teller? And over time, the peddler discovered that, of course, the fortune teller had had a very challenging life, had had a miserable, a, a, a sad, tragic experience. His own family had perished in a fire while he was gone away. But he would not talk about it, except for one thing. The peddler was never concerned about the future, but only about the present. There's something about people who are concerned only about the present that brings stories out. And so every opportunity, as the teller would hear the tumbling of the rocks and they traveled along, the peddler would simply say, your family died and that's such a sad thing, so how did you become a teller? And eventually the fortune teller said, I had to speak from the truth of my heart. And of course that was simply pain. And the peddler said, for that I'll give you another stone. And he pulled off the side of the road and he raised up the back of the cart and that's when the fortune teller saw what it was. You might have already figured it out. It was simply a machine that would smooth rocks over time. And as the rocks smoothed, they would become polished into various gems. There was one or two left, and he pulled one out, and then he told the teller to reach over with a shovel to the side of the road where they dug out some more dirt and rocks. The, the, the peddler took a sifter, sifted the dirt away, and then poured the rocks inside. And as he pulled one out, all it was was just a rock. It was jagged. It was covered. He said, when you're present, you can see what's really there. When all you think about is the future, of course you miss what's really there. And then he put it back in the box, covered it up, and they began to tumble to the next town. Over time, the teller noticed that every time the peddler would give a stone, he always said a strange phrase. He would kiss the stone to the person who purchased it, and all of them different as though they matched that person's own story. But after handing it in their hands, placing it there, he would say, the grace of God is with you. The teller never understood that until after the peddler had died. And he himself took up passing out the polished stones. From that point on, he realized the key to seeing God's presence and grace was in simply being present. The future is always what it will be. The present is always what it's possible. And then he would hand a polished stone to the next person. The grace of God is with you. And when I gathered the family at the end of, of, the, of that evening, as everybody gathered, actually right before our meal time, I gathered them all up and I thought to myself, what a strange gathering of people who, like the peddler's stones, every one of them have tumbled to this place. Who, like each of us gathered here, all of us have tumbled to this place where we find ourselves today. And like those folks that were gathered for the breakfast, not this morning, I wasn't in there, but a few mornings, a few Sundays ago on the 22nd, and there were various individuals of all walks of life gathered, and I remember someone coming to me and saying, how do I speak to that person? How do I talk to that person? And I smiled and said, it's not a whole lot different from some of your family. We're all tumbling. Maybe you just need to be present. You don't have to fix the future. We just have to be present. And so we reached out, took hands, and I gave thanks for the way in which my family has intentionally, for these years, chosen to look past every single difference and simply be present. Amen.